Good evening, everybody. You're so welcome. Thank you for coming to series two and episode two of Thinking Gay, a program in which we role reverse and try to understand the perspective of those who identify as gay as we consider this topic of banning therapeutic choice. You're very welcome. And once again, it's great to have my colleague, Dr. Laura Haynes. How are you doing, Laura? Hi, Mike. Great. Thank you. I'm so glad to be with you again. Last week, we reflected on Emily Sargent's piece, Gay Conversion Therapy, My Undercover Investigation in the Times. On Friday last, 6th of August, the Story of Our Times podcast released the first of seven podcasts presented by Emily Sargent entitled Thinking Straight, Part 1, Conversion. Check the link and search for the title Thinking Straight if you'd like to listen to Emily's presentation. You can also check out our program from Thursday last on the IFTC YouTube channel or the Core Issues Trust website homepage. And this evening, we're going to be inviting a range of people, professional people who are involved in the whole issue of working with clients who have unwanted feelings and desires and want to work using a therapeutic or counseling approaches to see what can be done about that. We also have um, a policy researcher who I think has a very um, clear perspective in terms of the historicity of all of this and what has developed through the years. So we're going to be introducing several people to you this evening, and uh, I think we should begin right away. So welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming today. Uh, it would be great if you could introduce yourselves. I think some are still on their way. Can we start with you, Anne? Give us a, a minute or so in terms of who you are and what you do. Thanks, Mike. Um, yes, I am um, a psychotherapist. So I treat uh, primarily, sorry, um, adults with complex traumatic stress, uh, usually as a result of childhood sexual abuse or rape or um, kidnapping, those kind of things. And so I'm kind of in my retirement phase. But um, lately, the last couple of years, I have actually um, been more focused on the conversion therapy bans in Canada. Canada. And today, actually, our uh, news report is that our Prime Minister is calling an election for September 20th. So wow. that will stir things up again in Canada. Well, from Canada all the way, thank you so much for being here tonight. And Karis, can you introduce yourself? Say something. Oh, Karis is gone. <laughs> She'll be back. Um, Libby, it's so good to have you. Tell us who you are and just a flavor um, in terms of what you do and why all of this might be relevant to you. Uh, yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, so I'm Libby. I'm 24 and I'm a theology student, but I'm also um, what we would describe as ex-transgender. I believed myself to be transgender for over a decade and actually transitioned and lived as a trans man for about six or seven years in total. Um, and I've left that lifestyle now. Um, and my experience is just about having experienced what the type of therapy that the NHS offers to young people when they believe that they're transgender and also having experienced what X Out Loud and Corrigies Trust have to offer. It's so good to have you, Libby. And uh, heads up, folks, there's soon to be a book release called X Out Loud, Emerging L Former LGBT Voices. Uh, Libby's been very much involved in that. And if you want to see before and after in terms of Libby's story, get the book. It's a really great story that she presents in there. Uh, so let's move on. Karis uh, will be back, I'm sure, as soon as she can, and uh, we'll introduce her at that point. But Laura, take us on. 
Well, let's next? not forget ex Loud director Matthew Grick, who can't be with us tonight, but sent this message. Take a look. Hi there, this is uh, Matthew Grick, and um, it's my pleasure to comment on uh, the first episode of Thinking Straight by Emily Sargent. Um, I heard and I listened to the full episode and um, I am aware that Emily uh, quoted me when I was celebrating the fact that God is raising an army of men and women leaving LGBT and I still stand by those words uh, big time. I think it's wonderful that we are seeing uh, such a group of believers all across the world who um, are very happy to explore a change in their sexuality, very happy to stand by their values and beliefs. And I think it's really worth supporting and celebrating their lives. And um, I was also uh, talking about how X Out Loud had interviewed just over 29 testimonies of uh, people leaving LGBT. Um, what an honor and what a privilege that we have come this far and more to come. So, yeah, I, I think it was really strange when uh, Emily was talking about an extremely secretive practice such as so-called conversion therapy. I thought, what is she talking about? Because um, Corvish's Trust has been doing so much public work and advocacy um, uh, you know, we have our own episodes that Emily herself referred to. So I could not understand why she's making it sound like this stuff is happening in the dark where nobody sees it. It's just not that at all. Um, if you go on the Courses, Courses Trust YouTube page, uh, you know, you'll see some of Mike's work uh, and his teaching on counselling, which I highly recommend that people uh, would observe. Um, so... That was strange, and I thought it was so unethical and potentially illegal that she even aired Carol's um, words from the session itself. I mean, where is the integrity um, in that? I, I find it so bizarre. Um, I don't do that to people because I respect um, the confidentiality of our conversations. So I think, uh, you know, Emily Sargent just showed who she really is by airing Carol's comments, to be honest. That's my opinion. Um, she made it sound like the fight for equality will be over once conversion therapy has been banned. Um, actually, <laughs> equality will never be achieved if a minority is given supreme status over another um, minority. I think uh, that's self-destructive. So... Yeah, that's not true. I noticed that uh, Jane Ozan really aimed at the gifts of the Holy Spirit, exorcism, prayer and fasting. These are sacred Christian disciplines. And she was trying to mock these practices. And um, I did not appreciate that. I did not appreciate her tone. And um, she also said that the majority of conversion therapy in Britain is taking place in re religious contexts. She's making it sound like it's the church's fault that this is happening and that this narrative is being promoted, etc. But it's clear that she's attacking the church. She seriously has a problem with the spirit-filled church that is operating in the power of the Holy Spirit. And um, yeah, that's, that's uh, really not friendly to to thousands of Christians in the UK and in the world. So that is very bizarre. Um, it was also said that homosexuality and heterosexuality are not conscious choices. I disagree with that because we know that um, we might not choose what we feel, but we have choices, choices around um, our sexuality, our sexual feelings, actually. And so... Um, yeah, I, I of course don't find that to be true. And that uh, presupposes that homosexuality and heterosexuality are all about feelings. Um, 
Whereas we deny that because for us, it's about practice. It's about what we do with our bodies and how we treat our bodies. So um, yeah, that's something else I noticed. And then this study from the Ozen Foundation was mentioned. Uh, 450 people who had gone through so-called conversion therapy, 3% were happy. Really. I, tr I believe that is so not a random sample. It doesn't sound like a random sample to me. And it sounds to me like a very, very biased, um, planned survey and study. So yeah, that's not to be trusted. The, the thing is, uh, studies and research is used by the LGBT lobby to promote their own agenda their own narrative and uh, people should seriously look, look into the way these, um, this research and these studies are being conducted. Well, thank you, Matthew, for kicking us off. We're going to have a detailed conversation about all of that in a few minutes. And it's very good to hear from Matthew, one of the people, of course, who Emily Sargent uh, recorded or um, played an extract uh, of. Um, if you've just tuned in, what are we doing here? Well, we're reviewing episode one of Thinking Straight Conversion, which is a podcast that was put out by the Times, the Sunday Times and the Sunday Magazine last Friday. You'll see episode two tomorrow. And during this time, we just want to review this a little. But um, before we continue, Karis is here. Karis, introduce yourself and um, just give, give us a flavor of what you do and what makes you passionate in terms of uh, the work that you do. And then a little bit later, we'll, we'll continue with our discussion about the issue at hand. I'm a public policy analyst uh, for Christian Concern, and one of the things that I do is is um, look at all the policy area of banning conversion therapy. I'm also on the um, executive board and research board of IFTCC, um, and so obviously that's highly relevant. I should say I was surprised, I've been surprised over the last three years, how much, um, how broad this area of policy has become. When I first wrote about it, I knew the issues around the mental health, um, and I covered the banning of Voices of the Silenced film, but the documentary. But um, since then, looking at the various things like the Memorandum of Understanding and so on, I've been really struck by how it's an everyman issue. It touches on right. all sorts of aspects of human life, and it would affect people who aren't identifying as LGBT, it would affect their families, uh, children, marriage, teaching, social work, religious freedom, free speech, all sorts of issues. And they're very broad, a bit like pro-life issues. And that's what motivates me is the breadth of it and, and the fact that when you can see further, you realise um, that this is not just a minority issue. Um, yes. Great. Thank you, Karis. It's really important that this is not just something that affects a very small percentage of the population. This affects the grandmothers, the grandfathers, the adults, parents, children, everybody in the land is going to be affected by this. So I think it's a really important topic. But now, folks, I'm going to just change the focus for a few minutes here this evening. Some of you will know that every week, uh, we have been looking at the whole issue of evidence and ideology and how we work with evidence and what the role of ideology is. And over the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at the Vesuvian towns, two of them, Pompeii and Herculaneum, two cities that were covered in AD 79 uh, by volcanic ash and all the rest of it that came out of Mount Vesuvius. And what's interesting is this question of whether or not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ actually reached these towns before the eruption took place. Some say yes, and some people say no. 
we have to look at the evidence and try to make a decision. We've seen all sorts of things. We saw the cross in the bakery that is disputed. We saw the cross in the house of the bicentenary uh, in the city of Herculaneum. Some people saw it as a Christian artifact from the first centuries. Other people deny it. There's, there's different things. But today, we want to look at something else that many people have felt was uh, an important Christian artifact. And I'm talking about the rotus or the settle um, square. These are kind of mind games, I guess, from the first century. And some people see in this a Christian message. Now, what I'm interested in is, is to know how we evaluate. Uh, how we work through different points of view and eventually arrive at uh, a point of view that we can hold to intelligently because we've not just accepted somebody's point of view or we've not just, you know, made a connection with what some authority has said, but we've, we've read as much as we can, we've looked as far as we can, and then we're able to make a decision that works for us. Have a look at this video. It seems to me that with the very clear evidence of Christian establishment and development of a mature church in Rome by AD 57, together with the arrival in Italy of the Apostle Paul and his obvious celebration among fellow believers in AD 60, that we're not wrong in pursuing evidence of Jesus' devotion in the nearby port town of Pompeii. We've looked at the cross in the baker's shop of the Ariana Poliana, together with the 19 equilateral street crosses, and we've checked out the story of the cross found in the house of the Bicentenary in Herculaneum. But I'm back now in Pompeii, heading towards the Palestra, opposite the amphitheatre in Pompeii. I'm meeting archaeologist Paolo Gardelli again, and also another person, Dr. Peter May, someone who has taken an interest in the famous Rotus or Sator Square, which many believe to be yet another evidence of Christian or Jewish influence in the town. And here we are now, at the palestra. There's something important I'm beginning to realize about the nature of the evidence for Jesus' devotion or a Jewish presence in these towns that we need to recognize. I think I'm correct in saying that, on their own, it would be difficult for any of these artifacts to stand as proof of Jesus' devotion or of religious Jews being present. What counts is how they relate to one another, or, in other words, whether or not there is any degree of triangulation evident relating to these artifacts. Now, the fact is that when dealing with the Rotus or Sator Square, scholarly opinion about this is diverse. Some see Christian, others Jewish, and still others Mithraic origins of the Rotus Sator Square. If you didn't know, Mithraism spread throughout much of the Roman Empire in the first century, focusing on the god Mithras, inspired by Zoroastrianism. It was popular in the Roman army and was an early rival of Christianity. The Rotus Square is a palindrome, which is a puzzle of five Latin words in this case, that can be read from left to right, but from right to left, and from top to bottom, and from bottom to top. And so these five words have been a puzzle to many people for a long time, and they haven't been able to crack it. There doesn't seem to be a simple solution, and yet they're found all over Europe and in further parts of the world, in Ethiopia and in England. Um, but the oldest was found here. Now, the only solution that has been put forward to explain this palindrome is that the letters represent Paternoster, our father, but because of the square, in the center of the square, there's only one letter N. So N becomes pivotal, and therefore the Paternoster can be written twice only if it's written as a cross. But the reality is that two of them have been found here in Pompeii. One of them in the palestra behind me, 
what makes it controversial is that there are scholars who say that Christianity had not reached Pompeii before the eruption of Vesuvius. And this would be very clear evidence that it had. There is a leftover alpha and omega in the puzzle. And there are two extra A's and two extra O's. And the argument has been that this didn't exist, the significance of alpha and omega, until the book of Revelation was written. But there's no reason to suppose that, that Jesus wasn't seen as the beginning and the end. Uh, we know that that idea occurs in the book of Revelation. The Rotas Square indicates that it also would have been in Christian thinking earlier than that. Some people have argued that the Rotas Square was written after the discovery of the ruins and was uh, an addition later. But being found in two places and being submerged in the volcanic ash, that view doesn't seem credible, that it is generally believed this square was there in, and unearthed when the treasures of Pompeii were unearthed. It could be Jewish in origin, except that the idea of God being our father is a very minor theme in Judaism and a very major theme in Christianity. In the Gospels itself, Jesus, God is referred to as Father over 150 times, and in the New Testament as a whole, over 250 times. So this was a major idea. The other thing that's fascinating is that the second line of the Lord's Prayer, hallowed be thy name, focuses attention on the letter N for no man. That in the center of the square and at the pivot of the cross draws attention to the second line of the Lord's Prayer, hallowed be thy name. The Christians claim that the name was the name above every name, that it's at the name of Jesus that every knee should bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. And so the name for God was greatly elevated uh, by the Christians and seen as the name of Jesus. There have been concerns that the Alpha and Omega originated in the book of Revelation and wasn't known earlier. Um, but if the Rota Square is as it, it seems to be, then clearly the idea of Alpha and Omega predated the book of Revelation. There are several other inscriptions that may well be indicative of not only a Christian presence, but also of a Jewish presence in the town. All of them attract both those who affirm, but also those who reject any claim of Jewish or Christian presence. It really points out the need to carefully review and then to analyse all of the material on a case-by-case -case basis. We know about the manufacture of kosher garum serving a Jewish community, but there have been other inscriptions like the, one, the words Sodom and Gomorrah also the inscription Poinim Kerem, which seems to, in some cases, mean utter destruction and seems to point to a judgment as revealed in the Hebrew scriptures. We also know about the word Christianus, which is a transliteration found close to the Lupinarium. The importance, of course, of all of this is that there must have been a dispersal of some 20,000 Jews who were taken into captivity after the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. We don't know where they went, but at least one publication has spoken about their presence in multiple cities in this region. So I don't think it's beyond all reason to speculate that they would have been here. And if the Jews were here, presumably there may well have been some Christians among them. Clearly, there was some kind of presence here. We don't know much about it. Pompeii is only 50 kilometers or so from Pozzuoli, where Acts chapter 28 records the Apostle Paul landed and stayed for a week with a group of Christians before he went on to the city of Rome. I think it just provides a fascinating place where you can begin to feel what it must have been like in a town in this region at the time. So what do you think, folks? Don't you find that interesting that in all of those five lines, the same word that can be read from top to bottom, 
and bottom to top and from left to right, there's one N which in the Latin stands for nomen or name. And when you unscramble it all, it reads in the shape of a cross, Paternoster, our Father. Now, for some people, that is conclusive evidence that this is a Christian artifact and that this game that was common among um, the Roman army is something to do with the emerging Christian uh, ethos that was beginning to develop in the world. But then you pick up other monographs, such as the one I'm looking at by Mola, and he writes about the, Mithraic, the Mithraic origin and meaning of the rota square. So you may be saying, well, so what and who cares? But what we're doing here, folks, is assessing evidence and learning how important it is to be very careful before we dismiss things. It's really important to know what exactly it is that we are looking at and then to read as widely as possible to understand how uh, things fit together, the pros and cons. In other words, we have to test our ideology by the evidence that we experience. It's as though we all have to come and we have to put before scientific method those things that are close to our heart so that we can understand the truth and not be deceived and misled by our own belief systems and the prejudices that I'm afraid we probably all have when it comes to different worldviews and perspectives. So just a thought. Check us out next week and we'll continue this study. So, folks, it's uh, great to have everybody back. <clears throat> and um, I've got something that I would like to ask, but um, I think I must step back. And Laura, do you want to get us going? What do you think about what Emily said in the podcast? Well, an underlying foundation for what she said was that same-sex attraction, and I presume she didn't necessarily say this, by, but by implication also transgender identity or incongruent gender identity, are simply biologically determined. She certainly certainly had her, uh, quoted her expert who said that same-sex sexuality is biologically determined and not a choice. Well, we would, I would agree that people don't choose to have same-sex feelings and uh, just choose them away uh, just like that, a snap of a finger. Otherwise, we wouldn't be offering them assistance. But I do disagree with her about um, same-sex sexuality being simply biologically determined. Even the American Psychological Association in its APA Handbook of Sexuality and Psychology says same-sex sexuality and gender incongruent identity are not simply biologically determined. It says that same-sex sexuality has, um, can, that there are, uh, there, that uh, childhood sexual abuse has associative and potentially causal links to having same-sex partners based on research that includes a 30-year study of documented cases of childhood sexual abuse, the APA handbook praised the rigor of this study and drew its conclusion based on research evidence. So there are psychological causes. In fact, the handbook says there are psychoanalytic causes as that may work as or, or stand as main effects, that means standalone causes all by themselves or in interaction with biological influences. It also entertains the possibility that there are psychological causes, including pathological causes, for gender incongruent identity and says that it is likely a mixture of causes. In fact, there is international research um, that one study in Finland of all the adolescents who were applicants over a two-year period for sexual reassignment services 
Now, 75% had high rates of psychiatric disorders, and the study said that these were usually pre pre existed the, the uh, thoughts about gender. It was rare that they were secondary to thoughts about gender. It also said that bullying and high rates preceded thoughts about gender. 92% of these adolescents, and in most cases, 75% was these were not about gender presentation. Uh, nice. And the bullying was great. So these are other causes of same-sex sexuality that would reasonably call for therapy and that if treated may lead to a de decrease in same-sex attraction or behavior or transgender identity. There's also a okay. study. Laura. Quickly, in the United States, that says <laughs> it's very strong, says the same thing. We're going to come back to you, but I just want All to right. point out something. You can see Laura's gift, can't you? You can see that Laura actually is a deep sea diver. Uh, some of us are windsurfers and we stay on top of the wave and we look at the things broadly. But Laura is definitely a deep sea diver and we do need the deep sea diving and we'll be coming back to that. But I want to ask a question, and I'd love to hear from Libby and from Karis, if she's, if she's there, um, as to some of the things that Emily said. For example, when talking about conversion therapy, Emily said it's taking place in many different forms right across the UK. What do you think, folks? Did you hear that, Karis? Is conversion therapy happening in many forms and happening right across the UK? What do you make of that statement? Anybody? Karis, you'll have to unmute. Okay, we'll come back to Karis. How about you, Libby? What What do you make of this? Do you have any thoughts? Um, yeah, actually, um, I was really interested by I think the majority of the um, podcast seemed to focus a lot on these far-reaching methods of conversion therapy, these sort of it's all across the country. And it was, I actually calculated only about seven minutes actually focused on um, therapeutic choice and core issues trust um, and I was really astounded by the focus that was given and the conflation between these negative spiritual practices these negative um, therapeutic practice therapeutic practices these abuses basically you know hitting people over the head with bibles electric shock therapy corrective rape um, things that as she mentioned herself, I think she actually said, um, what's the, the, the quote? It was something like, the, um, this is not just limited to sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, and that's absolutely true. As somebody myself who's actually been through spiritual abuse and um, maladaptive spiritual attempts at things like exorcism, um, which like as Matthew said as Christians we believe that there are good and evil spirits and demonic possession is a serious and negative thing it's not the same when somebody looks at a person and says be gone the devil when the Holy Spirit's not told them that the devil is in that person for example um and those things they're not just they're not LGBT issues I don't understand the conflation there that's the thing that upsets me. Those are abhorrent practices, but people who attempt these spiritually abusive practices, they're not just trying to cast the gay out of people. They're trying to cast the anxiety out of people. They're trying to cast the confusion or the um, sexual promiscuity, even heterosexual sexual promiscuity out of people. It has nothing to do with um, LGBT in particular. So I don't understand what the link is between these abhorrent practices and then zoning into the LGBT community and then broadening then to apply it to therapeutic choice and core issues trust. I don't, it feels like a logical fallacy to me. 
So uh, let me just to clarify, and I, I'm, I'm really hoping to come to Karis in a minute. I think what you're saying, you're recognizing that there is such a thing as legitimate spirituality and um, deliverance work, that we, we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. But you're also acknowledges, acknowledging that there can be extremes. And you've spoken about some of the things that you've gone through. Um, and you're pointing out that there is, um, I don't know, like a, a non secretor in terms of the relationship between all of this and the work that therapists and uh, ministries such as, as, as ours are doing. Is that fair? Yeah. Yeah. Great. In fact, I would go as far to say that Cora's Use Trust and uh, practices like that are something that can help people to stay away from those abusive spiritual practices. Mm -hmm. This is a support group more than anything for X Out Loud for me. Great. Karis, have we got you yet? Yes. Go ahead. I think um, I think uh, what was said about, well, it's happening all over the place, shows that she can't be bothered to deal with the problem of the definition of conversion therapy, which is something we've dealt with extensively, written about um, publicly. And I think that's a real problem for a journalist. A journalist should be investigating properly the history of the definition, why it's come about. Is it actually used? The term isn't used mostly by um, professionals. It's certainly not used in, in churches. It's um, arbitrarily imposed. Um, and I think then the question is not just about her, but about the editors who allowed um, this podcast series to go ahead with that term. Good um, point. I think those are, are major problems by now with all the journalism or what passes as journalism on, on this issue is that it's actually propaganda. Um, and it calls into question the independence of the press. And, and a, an outfit like the Times like to think of itself as independent of the government of the United Kingdom of the state, but it's, it, it's not clear that it is. It's actually doing the government's bidding at this point. Karis, that's a major point. And can we just stay with this, folks, for a bit longer? Um, Anne in Canada and also Laura in the USA. I know claims have been made about uh, uh, literally hundreds of thousands of people experiencing gay conversion therapy. What do you think is behind this? What, what are they trying to say uh, when they talk about these huge numbers? Have you any perspective, Anne? Okay. Um, sorry, Mike. I'm having a lot of trouble with my internet provider. No sorry. problem. I hope you can hear me. Okay. Did you hear what I asked um, you? Not really. Okay. Just let me recap. So we keep hearing that, you know, I think in one case, 700,000 people may have been exposed to conversion therapy in various countries. I know it's been said of uh, the USA. It's now being said of the UK. All of a sudden, everybody's been exposed to this terrible practice. What is happening there? Why are they doing this? Do you have a perspective? Yeah, I do. I think, for instance, the word may does not mean that it's an absolute. You know, language is really, really important. The other thing is um, the pooling of LGBTQ individuals from uh, a certain strata of society, which is usually they're found um, that for the um, studies in Canada, for sure, at gay bars and, and different... Um, homosexual and uh, where, where people go to meet people and these people for sure are not interested in um, in leaving particularly um, an LGBT um, persona they perhaps have been from the churches which I think a lot of them have been but the numbers I mean the numbers they're saying just don't line up and I don't think that there is the research out there there actually support the claims. 
Okay, Anne, what, what about you, um, Laura? What do you say? counseling is. So it could be anything from Aunt Susie encouraged a child to wait till they're 18 to become sexually active, um, whether it's in their same-sex sexuality or whatever, or to wait till 18 to, to alter their body, give it some more time to think about it. It could be a physician who um, did an evaluation for whether there were this is appropriate for this person um, that was seen as trying to discourage them or a physician who, or a therapist who told them the, the harms, the potential, the pros and cons, so they would be aware of the effects, the harm, potential harmful effects on their health of um, intervening in their endocrine systems and reproductive systems uh, and, and on a permanent basis. So these could be reviewed as uh, attempts at conversion therapy to change someone really if someone went to a pastor and asked for prayer and the pastor said one prayer with them that could count be counted anything really at all and uh, by a group being surveyed who understand the political purpose of the survey is to demonstrate that it's har this is harmful because they really just want to push an ideology they don't want anyone to think there are some people who don't find LGBT identity and experiences fulfilling. They tried it, they didn't find it fulfilling. There are people who want to save their marriage and family to the people they sure. love, people who want to live by the faith they love, and so on. Okay, Laura, very good points there. Do uh, David Pickup, it's so good to see you. Thank you so much for coming. Um, David, just give us a sentence or two to contextualize things tell us who you are and what you do i'm a licensed marriage and family therapist and supervisor and my private practice is in houston texas uh, my private practice is uh, exclusively dealing with uh, gender dysphoria and primarily boys and men who are dealing with unwanted homosexual feelings and i also train therapists now that's new that's wonderful. So a supervisor, a trainer, and a practitioner, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a lot of uh, experience that David is bringing. David, if you didn't hear the question, what we picked up on is the fact that um, LGBT folks are telling us, one report I read was that 700,000 people have been exposed to conversion therapy. What is this all about? Do you have a perspective? What, what's the goal here? Why are they saying that? And, 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 and what are they trying to achieve, would you say? Their research is faulty. If you'll just simply ask anyone who did it what, how they did their research, you'll realize that they cherry pick and they uh, mislabel. They don't understand what real therapy is. They... Uh, most likely they've considered anyone who gets a talking to by a pastor as conversion therapy. And there's a certain viewpoint that says, okay, I can kind of see that. But that, of course, is done so that they can persuade the entire world that massive amounts of people have undergone psychotherapy for, uh, for um, uh, change, attempt their sexuality or, or gender. Suicide and, and depression and anxiety, and they want nothing more, in my opinion, to convince the world that they have to be right in everything they believe about LGBT ideology. But they cannot tolerate, uh, for political reasons, I believe it's ultimately for, because of cognitive dissonance, that they can't tolerate an opposite viewpoint because their own foundation of their being will be 
taken out. And so they just can't handle that from an emotional standpoint. Unfortunately, that makes them rather bigoted, even if it's un unconscious, it makes their viewpoint very myopic and their viewpoint then ends up being careless of what other people have experienced of real change, real growth in people of faith cases, in real increase of faith and strength in who they truly are. They cannot face that. And so there, it forces them to try to force the world to believe exactly what they believe. And as such, it becomes very dangerous. So, Karis, Anne, Laura, and Libby, question to all of you. Am I correct when I say that I think what we are experiencing here is LGBT activists who are wanting to say whoever disagrees with this notion that people can move away from homosexuality. In other words, anybody who resists the normalization of homosexuality, in fact, is being labeled as a conversion therapist. It's a very broad net that is being spread to catch as many uh, criminals uh, in, in the net. Is that, do you think that's reasonable? I think so. I think when we, um, if we look at the um, wording of the law in Malta that was passed in 2016, it doesn't use the term conversion therapy, it uses the term conversion practices. Okay. And um, that is recommended in some different jurisdictions, and it would have come from ILGA, from the global LGBT umbrella group. But I think we can make a comparison with the term gay affirmative therapy, which has been around since the 1980s. Mm -hmm. But by the late 1990s and early 2000s, you had the term gay affirmative practices. And that was coming into social work with young people. Um, and yet they were obviously very closely linked um, because social work and mental health are always going to be closely linked. Um, so I think we should always be uh, looking out for this in whichever jurisdiction, uh, where there's, whether it's a private member's bill put by an opposition politician or whether it's a government sponsored bill, uh, we should be looking at this. And I think the other thing that joins all these things together, which we never really discuss, is queer theory which is this kind of uh, pseudo-academic philosophy that normalizes all of this, um, developed by people like Judith Butler and so on in the 1990s. When you actually look at the text of um, academic defenses of LGBT affirmative therapy, um, from Britain even, um, where, th where people pride themselves on being more empirical, um, and less uh, theory-laden, generally across the humanities and social sciences, especially in England. In reality, what you've got is um, underneath is queer theory. Okay, so queer theory, we need to sometime, I think, visit that. I'm just going to shift gears slightly here. Here's another question I want to ask you. I don't know if you picked it up, but Emily herself said that things like corrective rape are already illegal in England and that some of the more extreme practices no longer take place and some like Professor Michael King referred to aversion therapy and electroshock approaches that are no longer used but then Emily kind of comes in to make her point and she says this actually talking about core issues trust and uh, I don't know if you remember, she refers to a series that Core Issues Trust did where we looked closely at the therapeutic methods. And the whole purpose of doing that was to be more transparent and to let people in to the counseling room so that they could see what we do. And she said, actually referring to me, that I look harmless until I open my mouth and you hear what I'm saying, something, something like that. But here's my question. This is what Emily says. She says um, that it is, now where is it? She says it's underground, it's subtle, and it's insidious. And it seemed to me that those are the reasons why Emily rationalizes that she has to go underground. <laughs> Yes, I because think of to, all this, it's to justify her deception and to project motives. 
Okay. Uh, negative motives onto people she disagrees with. That we are uh, we are secretive and we we are deceptive. Okay, so here we are, folks, secretively <laughs> broadcasting on YouTube and Facebook and <laughs> pretty well wherever we can get into. That's what we're doing because we want debate and we want to be able to have a conversation. Uh, you know something, folks, that what strikes me is that Emily's not here, unfortunately, and Dr. Michael King is not here, and J Jane Ozan, sadly, is not here. So I wonder, before we continue, if we shouldn't just give them an opportunity to speak their mind. And to do that, I'm going to ask us to just take a minute to, to meet Jane Ozan and listen to what she said, and then we can continue with our discussion. We're, we're about to meet a man who describes himself as ex-gay and says he knows how to make gay people uh, go straight. He himself underwent counselling for uh, homosexuality and has been married for nearly 40 years. Uh, Jane, let's start with you. Uh, you're not that man, obviously. Um, <laughs> but how, how do you feel about this type of so-called therapy to change gay people to straight people? I think it's incredibly dangerous, Stephen. And I, I know that myself. That's part of my own testimony. But I also know that because that's research that I've been doing uh, with a, a very influential board to go out and talk to people who've been through conversion therapy. And, you know, the, the level of attempted suicide, the level of... Of, of suicidal thoughts, of anxiety, depression amongst those who've tried to change their sexuality has, is, is astronomically and high. And you've been through it. I have too. It landed me in hospital twice, fighting for my life and my body really screaming. And I must admit, I'm really concerned about us having even this debate on television where people in, in a world where they like to be straight... I, God, I can imagine in Northern Ireland, luckily I don't live here, but wanting to, to try and fit in, wanting to try and be what I believe is godly, and yet knowing that what I'm putting myself through will cost me ultimately my sanity in many cases so, of my life. So, Dr. Mike Davidson, how do you change someone from being straight to being gay, from being gay to being straight? How does that work? Well, I wouldn't know, uh, Stephen, because that's not what we do. What we do is explore sexual fluidity. We believe that people have the right and the freedom to choose the direction that they want to go in. And if it's true what the scientists are telling us, that sexuality is fluid, then we should take them seriously. Do you think people can choose? I didn't choose the feelings I had, but I had choices around those so feelings. But you're saying it's fluid. So you think, like, could you get up tomorrow morning and decide to be gay? There was a point in my life when I decided I wanted to go in a different direction. But you can't. And that's... Well, I did. But no, Jay. but Stephen, uh, sorry, Mike, you cannot change your innate desire. All the science, you've just quoted science, all the science, all the scientists, all the academics, all the medical profession will say that you cannot change your innate desire. You well, might be able to try and change your behavior, no, that's which is not lying true. to yourself. How does it work? No, it is true. It's completely so true. So, how does it actually, how do, you, how do you change who you fancy? First, I need to say that the APA in the 2014 oh, document... No, you I'll tell me. Don't that, quote though. them. Yeah. You tell me. How do you change who you're attracted to? You listen to the scientific views that tell us that there is always psychological conditions around this issue that need to be visited. Number around one... Around what issue? Around the issue of unwanted attractions to the same sex for Unwanted. some people. And that's the key thing. You see, there is a level of homophobia, internalised homophobia, which means they cannot accept who God has created them to be. And that's because of culture, that's because of religious teaching. And that is what drives so many people to a point, Mike, where they come and try and find you. I've, I've been talking today to people who've been through your prayer ministry and have tried to commit suicide at the end of it. Really? Because, yes, I have. Because ultimately they are put in such a difficult place where they know the prayer's not working where they feel ashamed, where they feel that God is not answering their prayers, where they feel so dis, 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 disembodied... OK, I'm going to come into the audience and see what we think straight away. Go ahead. Point. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, but this makes me absolutely fuming. If you're gay, you're gay. You're straight, you're straight. You. Why should you have to change? Yeah. Why can't we, you just love whoever the blimmin' hell you want? It's an you, absolute joke. 
You what? shouldn't have to change, but you should have the freedom to no, choose the like direction yourself, that you want Christians to go. No, people like yourself, Christians, say that you should. That is a joke. I'm sorry. But if you, you should not well, 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 But what, he, but what he's saying is he's not forcing it upon anyone, but he's saying if someone does not want to be gay, then he will it's not a try choice, to help though. them. You're no. born, now, I thought. You're yeah. born to but be gay. Well, well, the science well, disagrees well, well. with you. It's, and by the so way, untrue. so does Peter Tetchell, so does no, Julie Mike. Bindle. No, oh, Peter Tetchell like doesn't. Mike, oh, he does. Like no, he doesn't. And like he's Jesus. also not here. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I need to come into the audience. Go ahead. Well, we've already been to you. We'll come to the front here. Go ahead. Yeah. I, I, I really, I, 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 I'm going to say to Mike, it's an unchristian mis message that he is bringing. God creates us all in his own image and likeness. He creates us to look like him and be like him. And trying to change the desires, trying to change people into something that God has not intended for them, is 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 is, is dangerous, and it is it, it is a terrible message to give young people, old people, and anybody who is either Christian or non-Christian. Okay, you can respond to that. Much. Nobody tried to change me. I went out of my own volition but you to engage. To Hold on, no, he's got to be able to. to he's got to be able to speak to engage with professionals who took me seriously and supported me in my own personal search. Why that doesn't get... mean that they didn't challenge me. They challenged me, but they gave me that freedom. And that is what is being denied. Why didn't Great you Britain want to be? Why didn't you want to fancy man? Because I was married and because there was something within me that taught me that that was not the direction that I wanted to go in. I think that's perfectly reasonable. I, I know it's not that, what Mike. I would put... OK, I'm going to go to the young fellow here in the glasses. You can't in one second. Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you. You're bringing in the argument of Christianity and, and teaching that way, but the Bible specifically states, Leviticus 18, you shall not lie with a man the way you lie with a woman. So yeah. there's no way that you can turn around to the doctor and say, He's wrong for deciding this. If you have a Christian belief in that, therefore he has every right to do that. No, we can have Thank a really. So can you can you can, can you team. choose can you choose to get up tomorrow morning and be gay or straight or fancy fancy that camera? Like, you can you choose who you're going to fancy? You should have. Could the, you fancy me tomorrow morning and I the guy beside you to, uh, tomorrow night and the person to your right the next night? Could you do that? As a Christian, I believe that gay marriage and gay relationships are wrong because I believe in the Bible, specifically it's what I've just question. said. not my question. I'm not asking so about a religious I'm belief. Turn, but no, I'm, I'm answering I'm your question. I'm not asking you, hold on. Yeah. I am not asking you about a religious belief, OK? I'm asking you, could you, as a human being, get up tomorrow morning and decide you're going to change your sexuality? You could, because apparently it's you 2019. Could. I couldn't. Why because not? my morals say I can't. No, I'm not talking about morals. I'm talking about... Then what your... are we talking about? Here's We're what talking, talking about. about his morals not... and saying he I'm got not. up and said, I don't want to have I'm this. I'm talking about, do you think the human being... I'm not talking about religion or morals. I'm asking you, do you think you could decide to change you, the chemistry in your brain, your sexuality? Could you do it? No. So how could a gay person? That's a decision inside themselves. Right. So you're not deciding to be straight but a gay person is deciding to be gay. Is that right? No, I am that's saying not what we're that saying. They should Stephen. have the issue... They should be allowed to rightfully have this therapy if they so wish. Stephen, we shouldn't I take that in? chance away and from them because I, then I they're I really understand that point of view because that is exactly how I lived for about 40 years. And, I, boy, I wanted to be straight. I tried everything in the book. I really thought, because the world I lived in, the bubble I lived in, taught me... It's so, like you've just said, that there it's six Bible verses out of 31,000 supposedly said that ga God didn't love gay people and I needed to be straight. Now, that put me in hospital and I chose voluntarily to go through all that, okay. but I did myself great damage I want... and I know that God loves me just the way well, I am and I believe that the Bible is extremely Co clear I want to speak to about Colin. this. Colin, evening to you. Evening, Stephen. Colin, you, um, you're gay, you're a Christian, and you've decided never to have sex in your life again. Yes. What a shame. Why? Because all my life I have struggled with this issue and I've not been able to square the two. I've tried. I've tried to compromise. I've tried to lead both lives and I've not been able to. And I know my Bible and it does say 
It's God strong. God loves you. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let him speak. Let yeah. him speak. Now, as for therapy, that's a different issue because I haven't been able to change. But if somebody wanted to change, I think they should have the freedom if they so choose. I don't think they should be forced, but I do think they should be allowed. Somebody emailed me a couple of days ago from the United States of all places who'd seen a letter of mine about this subject in the newsletter. Don't ask me how people in America can well, read why, the newsletter. Why don't you want to be yourself and everything of that entails? Well, I'll get to that in a minute, but this gentleman We've wasn't... We've only got a, two minutes and we're done. This gentleman wasn't a Christian and he had gone through the full process of leaving the gay lifestyle, married with children. And I find that interesting that he, it wasn't the... But let me talk about you. Yes. Are you not sad that you'll not be able to be in a relationship with someone ever in your entire life who you feel attracted to? Why would you deny yourself that? It is a sacrifice. It's something I have chosen to do. People. It's not an easy path for me or anybody else. And there are many like me within the church who are probably not as open as I am now. But even if you're not acting it out, yes. you must, everybody has fantasy. Yeah. So you must be fantasizing about men. Yes, same as a man would fantasize about a woman. Yeah. Uh, there's no difference in the lust or the desire, but because I know the Bible says it's wrong, I don't practice it. Michael? <laughs> Stephen, the reality of it is that medical opinion is against conversion therapy. GPs, uh, psychologists, psychotherapists, NHS, England, Scotland, they're all against Church it. Okay? Of and there's no, the, you know, the damage it does, as immense as journals have written about it, mm. uh, I would also be thinking more about the vulnerable teenagers who are insecure, yeah. they're trying mm. to fit in in society, yeah. and then you have organisations like yours which go around trying to promote this idea of trying to change somebody's sexuality. You should, you're disgraceful. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely wrong. Think of the vulnerable teenagers. Think of the people who live in rural areas. They are struggling, and your, your organization is really not helping, and I'm going to do everything I can to get conversion therapy banned in this country. <laughs> So you are prepared to take away the freedoms and I'm rights of yes. minority yes. groups who yes. don't agree to with you. Hold on, no, 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 no. He's got to speak. Here's the difference. Why has he got to speak? You are prepared to do that, but we are not saying that gay people should not be celebrated and Medical free on my to side live is against in. Medical opinions on my side, GPs are on my side. Mm. They're against you. Yeah, but, but it's absolutely true. The exactly, medical world exactly. has Against sold you, out my side. to an ideology that is slowly but surely crippling the society and taking it towards pansexuality and total oh sexual God, anarchy so in this it's country. Look, God God it. It. That's it's Hold on. true. It's friends. not true, Mike. And you know it's not. And the, and the difficulty here is okay. that it's like I'm a Hunger Games, I'm, if I can just I'm say this. I'm afraid we're out of time. I'm afraid we're out of time. It's just like the Hunger Games. There are people dying we, at home. We can talk about this tomorrow morning on the radio. We can continue it on the radio. Uh, well, we weren't allowed to talk any further about that on the radio. And just by the way, the two people that... Uh, Jane referred to as having gone through our prayer ministry, whatever that is, turned out not to have been clients of ours at all. So I'm afraid that was misrepresented. But folks, I wanted to give Jane the opportunity to speak clearly as Jane. So we're not just uh, talking about us and them. Anybody have anything they want to pick up on, on on this whole debate that is being played out now? Uh, yep. Mike, I, I don't know any professional organization, no matter how radical, no matter its position on therapy, that believes same-sex sexuality is innate or transgender identity is innate. <clears throat> and uh, the people who are who are want to take away the choice of their fellow people fellow uh, citizens who have same-sex experiences or gender congruent experiences are insisting on a viewpoint that it is innate and therefore any attempt to change it is uh, impossible and harmful. Um, so that is ideology and it is cognitive dissonance to them 
to hear that uh, it's not innate and that it commonly changes. Most people who experience same-sex sexuality experience both sex sexuality. And research has established that their same-sex, their attraction, or their sexual attraction commonly changes mostly toward or to exclusively heterosexual attraction. And they should have a right to have a therapy to strengthen that heterosexual side, to save their marriage and family, to live according to their faith, or for whatever reason they want without discrimination. And also the research shows that some people who are exclusively same-sex attracted, the best study, one, one in four exclusively lesbian women over six years did change sexual attraction. And um, uh, about a, you know half to a third of them to a, exclusive heterosexual attraction. Um, and then uh, about one in 12 to 13 exclusively same-sex attracted men also experienced change, and their changes were mostly to exclusively heterosexual. So it happens for some, even some who are exclusively mm -hmm. same-sex attracted. And, and anyone should have the right to explore their options for their own sexuality and gender identity. Thank That's you. Theirs, not Thank the government's. You. Uh, Laura, I want to just ask Libby something here. You've been sitting there patiently, Libby. You, you are somebody for whom this is a, you know, this has been a pretty life and death struggle, as I've understood you. What, what's your reaction in terms of this debate? And um, give us a, a perspective. Yeah. Um, so for those of you that could see me backstage while that was going on, I was sort of all sorts of different facial expressions as the debate went on. Uh, a few raised eyebrows, a few little sort of bit of laughter, really. Um, I think the first thing that I find really weird about this is uh, when I went in my sort of made that decision to leave transgenderism, I didn't make a decision to leave gender dysphoria. Oh, okay. We, we'll come back there. Somebody else want to pick it up? David or yes. Anne? Yes, yes, go ahead, David. Yes, the, I, I'm, I'm surprised actually that none of these people were challenged on the most fundamental basics to prove what they're saying. Uh, they weren't questioned, nor did they prove that their, that homosexuality is, uh, genetically inborn. Okay. It's quite simple in dealing with these people, although it can be very vociferous and dramatic at the same time. The question that they need to be asked and put to the fire and not move anywhere else until they answer the question is, how do you know? How do you know it's inborn? Get uh -huh. them to prove what they're saying. What science? Where did you find that? Uh -huh. this, uh, pseudo scientist doctor who is sitting next to you what is the science? Okay, what have you found that out? What study are you referencing? You won't be able to do it. Or if she does, she'll be able to say something that's easily refuted in terms of research. You uh -huh. take the foundation of inborn theory away and their entire issue, ideology, falls uh -huh. to the uh -huh. so, and, and so you, you heard constantly, person after person, anger after anger, kept exploding in little spots, mm -hmm. all because... You're, you guys are operating on two different belief systems. Mm -hmm. It's inborn, then what we do is condemnable. If it's not inborn, these people are LGBT are totally wrong. In principle, it really is that simple. But not many people are dealing and requiring people to prove what they're saying. Laura gave a good example of how you do give as much proof as we've got or can have using science and anecdotal evidence so th these people come off as people of love but without truth there is no such thing as love and they and, need to be told that in my opinion uh really helpful there david thank you so much um as soon as libby comes back we'll continue with libby libby just tell us this you were saying that um you were talking about your own gender dysphoria just just continue with what you were saying. Um, yeah, sorry, uh, that cut out a little bit. I think the app that I'm using for this. Don't is... worry. Um, yeah, so when I left transgenderism, I didn't have any idea in my mind that I could 
leave my feelings of gender incongruence behind that uh, gender dysphoria um that wasn't really anything that i was too bothered about mm -hmm. i was more focused on living for god and just you know i'd, I'd read my bible like um like that guy in the clip we just watched said you know i've read my bible and i'd actually come to a conclusion that was very different from what i'd grown up being taught and the conclusion that i'd come to considering all all of what the bible says and the faith that i have in god rather than in what the world says um i realized that i had to not fit in because fitting in in a small town with its own drag club and its own pride parade where i live um is being gay is being transgender being straight um this gender and Christian is the thing that's not the norm in this town. Um, that's the thing that's radically different. Um, okay. Yeah. So Great. For me, it wasn't about changing. It was literally about just changing um, the way that I lived. It wasn't about being happy that way. That's just a really fortunate thing that the things that make me happy are just the time I spend in prayer and the time I spend with the Lord rather than anything sexual or um, gender related. I'm not particularly happy about wearing a dress or wearing trousers. That's not what fulfills me in life. Okay, Libby, I'm sure some of the others may want to ask you some questions in a minute, but Karis, I wanted to ask you, referring to what Emily said in the podcast, she brought in Professor Michael King and uh, I just wondered if you could say anything about the role that he's being called to play in this podcast. What, what do you think that's all about? Well, I think um, he was brought in as an expert on history and to talk about aversion therapy or aversion technique. But of course, that's, that's something that um, was taken up by some behaviorists in psychiatry in the 1960s. This business of using, uh, you know, electroshock and exposing patients to pornography and making them feel sick and so on. And, uh, and that happened for about 10 years in the UK. Um, it had nothing to do with psychotherapy, nothing to do with Christian or pastoral care or that of any other faith. Uh, and what, but it's also more important even to look at what both um, Emily Sargent and Michael King, and just about everybody else who wants a therapy ban deliberately ignores, which is the evidence of the Wolfenden Committee hearings. Now, as you know, I've, I've gone through the transcripts of what the mental health professionals said to the Wolfenden Committee on Homosexuality. And just um, clarify what Wolfenden was. This is about so the decriminalisation. It was, was convened by the Home Office of the UK in 1956. Um, to look at homosexual offences and prostitution. And uh, they, the reason was that the Soviet Union had been found to uh, be targeting homosexual men, especially in the government, um, trying to uh, blackmail them, to, turning some to be um, double agents. And there was a fear about infiltration and a pa paranoia about that. But it became, you know, all sorts of people gave evidence from the criminal justice system and so on. And But there were also all the mental health professionals involved, therapists and psychiatrists, who actually saw not just patients, um, but also clients who came of their own accord. Um, just the kind of regular clients that you would have today. Um, and they gave evidence. And um, it is evident from the transcripts that they talked about change and how their clients would see a change in uh, away from same-sex attraction and that's public evidence that the government is aware of and is ignoring today um and people like michael king who's purportedly has looked into the history um they would know very well about this they're just deliberately ignoring it and the same with jane ozan the same with sergeant every single journalist they deliberately ignore it um, i've spoken about this publicly at the launch of iftcc and, and i know that the journalists heard me do that so that's a form of self-censorship um, and it's extremely important because this talking therapy may, was mainstream, change allowing therapy was mainstream, um, wasn't any single modality um, and uh, was sought out voluntarily. It wasn't very widely available outside London or Edinburgh actually, 
became more widely available much later when counselling and therapy became more mainstream in UK society. Um, and I think that one of the reasons that some people referred themselves as psychiatric patients or went through their doctor in the 60s and early 70s for these more crazy behaviorist aversion treatment is that they were not finding therapists. I can't prove that statement, but it is just possible because not everybody who went for these behaviorist type treatments was um, somebody sent by the courts. Because we've got to understand this, that the courts would send people who'd been caught um, and, and found guilty of homosexual offenses under the law at that time. And, and they might be sent to various mental health professionals. So, Karis, it's a very complicated picture. We're yeah. not getting that picture from those who want to ban. Folks, I, I guess what I thank you very much for what you're saying there, Karis. There's a there's a great deal of information there that I think you know we we do well to pay attention to. But here's my point. Michael King is introduced as being you know a senior person from the Royal College of Psychiatrists. And he is introduced as a scientist. Uh, Emily says such things as, Michael King is everything that I expect an academic to be. He's wise, he's this and this and this and this. So we set the stage here now for the authoritative view. And the fact that Michael King is a gay activist, has been the chairman of the, um, a special interest group of the Royal College of Psychiatrists for years is just left out of the picture entirely. What we have to take from this is that this is a scientist who's completely neutral and completely balanced in his point of view. Um, and I would have concerns about that. David, do you want to say anything further? We're coming to the end of our time here, but um, I want to yes. give you an opportunity. Yes, in an, in an effort, thank you, in an effort to just quickly um, know how to deal with, um, I forgot the woman panelist's name, Dr. Jane Ozan. Dr. Jane. Um, she was insistent that she talked to so many people who'd gone through therapy what the question for her is, and for anyone in this position, is who, what experts in therapy techniques have you talked with and about their case histories? Who have you done that? I would, I would guess very much that she's only cherry-picked research. I would guess very much that she's talked about all the people who've experienced horror stories and never bothered, which you can check out when you interview with anyone like this, which I highly suggest that be done immediately, is... What experts in therapy techniques who claim change have you discussed this with? She probably won't be able to name anyone. And therefore, you can tell her then, with all due respect, this is not science that you're depending upon. Um, so that, that betrays her, quote, scientific um, mentality. I She's hear what confident. you're saying, David, but I just want to throw this in, that for the last, what, 15 uh, maybe even 20 years, there has been a de facto ban in this country because of the Memorandum of Understanding. Okay, I know that came around 2014. But increasingly, mental health bodies have forbidden anybody who has a contrary point of view from even doing the training. There's, sure. It's been, there's a complete shutdown. I sure. mean, I'm, this is not answering what you're saying, but I think it's one of the frustrations in yes. terms of finding the professionals in this country who can talk this about this. Indeed. So turn to America, who is the mainstay, originally at least, of all these issues. And so what American experts has she talked to? It's a simple question. She probably won't be able to answer it. And so you can help the public see to help you battle that she's really not an expert, that she really doesn't know what she's talking about. She's extraordinarily biased. And so the, the proof is in the pudding so, so, so much. So just ask her, ask her have, you called, have you accessed any one of the experts in America? Um, you can give her my 
phone number, name, email, anytime. I'm happy to discuss with her in a very congenial, scientific manner, supportive of both sides and the feelings of both sides. Um, but the, the key is to go to the roots of where these people live and breathe, so to speak, and question scientifically what they're telling you. I think what you're saying is really important uh, from this point of view, David, that uh, therapists like Carol, who are being attacked, and there have been several in this country, probably more than we know about, where do they go? Who do they associate with? Because they become pariahs in a society that has sold out on one ideological point of view. So, I mean, I think it's good news that there are people all over the world who do not believe uh, what is happening here. And increasingly, uh, maybe it's really important to join hands and to be with others who um, can be supportive in this circumstance. I want to ask a quick input from Anne, and then I'm going to ask Laura to summarize where we're at at the end of this program. How about that, Laura? Get going, get ready. Anne, what do you think? Any, anything, any point you want to make? Well, so listen, this is a whole issue of values and a whole ideology of a new religion. Basically, it's a religion that opposes anything um, Christian, any Christian dogma that would say a man and a woman um, and that kind of marriage. And so it's a, a way to vilify those who uh, don't agree. And you know, we have one that way going on for 60 years. And that is exactly what you see happening when you listen to the audience and the anger, the absolute anger that they would be challenged, the, the anyone be challenged on that ideology with fact. And you know, it would be a wonderful day if the American Asso Psychological Association, the Canadian Psychological Association would actually re retract the lies for 60 years because it is a lie. And now the new research of fluidity exposes that lie, but no one's going to believe it because the propaganda that has happened throughout the culture for all these years has actually changed the minds of individuals. And that is a sad place to be. Okay, uh, I, I, I agree with Anne. I think that's a very strong statement about the ideology. And I think what we're seeing is subgroups with among people who have same-sex or gender incongruent experiences. And that the experiences of some are being taken to be the experiences of all. And so we have different people in silos not speaking to one another. Uh, we're not trying to silence them. They're trying to silence others who disagree with them. Um, and so the silos go on. This is happening in the mental health professional organizations. I've watched it happen. I was present when a gay activist went to a board and uh, convinced them to uh, take steps to ban therapy. The members of the board did not know the difference, some of them, between sexual attraction and gender identity. Hmm. These were not experts. In fact, they sat around and said to each other, we don't know anything about this. You're gay, you must be an expert. And he didn't present any science. So it is an ideological movement. And uh, we have people in silos and not, not hearing one another's experiences. I hope the United Kingdom will allow the experiences of all, all citizens to count and uh, you know, everyone to be able to have the choice about their own sexuality and gender. They, not the government, should decide the direction of their experiences. Thank you so much. Uh, Laura, my guests this evening, or our guests this evening, have been Libby Littlewood, Dr. Karis Mosley, David Pickup, Dr. Anne Gillies. You've done a great job. Thank you very much. You've taken us further on. So in closing tonight, folks, if you're interested in following the podcast that Emily Sargent is putting out via the, um, the Times and the Times magazine, then go to the podcast, Story of Our Time, 
And tomorrow, I believe, midnight tonight, the next episode will be out. And we'll be here all being well next Thursday with more experts and people with different points of view who want to analyze and pay careful attention to what she has been saying. So thanks again for coming and uh, God bless you and keep you.